Hare right, Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, we have various complications, so sorry about that. We're here in the temple room. That's part of the complication. Somebody was in the place where we usually meet, so. All right, so we're continuing. Slowly but surely. We're on seven, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Just, what one of the Justins said he wasn't going to be here, but the Las Vegas Justin, I'm not sure. Have you heard anything? No. I have not, but on our Wednesday Gita class, he tends to be like five or ten minutes behind everybody. Oh, okay. So, here, sure. so maybe he's just running behind. Okay, so this is lesson seven, uh, initiation vows. All right, so qualities of a disciple, strictly following initiation vows, challenges faced following initiation vows, solution to challenges, steps of rectification. Uh, qualities of a disciple. The servant or disciple of the spiritual master should be free from false prestige, never considering himself to be the doer. He should feel enmity toward no one, should be active and never lazy, and should give up all sense of proprietorship over the objects of the senses, including his wife, children, home, and society. He should be endowed with feelings of loving friendship toward the spiritual master and should never become deviated or bewildered. The servant or disciple should always desire advancement in spiritual understanding, should not envy anyone, and should always avoid useless conversation. So those are some of the high uh, marks of being a disciple. Um, a lot of these qualifications of a disciple, it's, it's almost like you're reading qualifications of a guru. You know? So it's... The, it's they're both high so all right so importance of following initiation vows so daya doya means uh mercy um so that is in relation to uh no meat eating so in other words if we follow that principle of not eating meat, fish, or eggs, then um, then uh, that will help us in being merciful, merciful toward others, merciful towards ourselves. Uh, this overall it will help us with that quality of mercy. And if if we fail in that principle, then um, we have a tendency to be more. Uh, or we will be, yeah, more violent and so on. Uh, generally, that's this one. This principle is not a huge principle that people have a hard time with. I mean, some people do. Um, I remember when I was in Kolkata, India. One of my friends was telling me that he made a local uh, Bengali a devotee, and he said that these people, they were very attached to fish because the Bengalis have a tendency to be attached to fish, eating of the fish. So uh, he said that they went so far to even try to offer that to the deity. Mm -hmm. Of course, they didn't know, but they're a home deity. But my friend said, oh, you can't do that. Um, and when he became a devotee, he's a Bengali, they were surprised. Everybody was saying, oh, how did you give up fish? It's so difficult, you know, we're so attached. So although it's generally not a problem, it could be. Um, I remember I met one devotee recently and he was telling me he uh, was having issues with that. 
he's not initiated, but um, so I was just telling them, you know, you have to chant Hare Krishna, pray to Krishna, try to associate with devotees as much as possible and pray, you know, to become free from this uh, addiction. Uh, so, yeah, but it's usually not a problem. Um, yeah. So then the next one is uh, intoxication. Um, not in, not not taking any intoxication. That corresponds with uh, austerity or tapa, and that. If we're intoxicated, or if we have a tendency to take intoxication, then we have a hard time practicing austerity. Um, of course, it's natural to want to be an intoxicated uh, in some ways. Like the Bhagavatam says that these are like natural inclinations or inclinations that we, human beings have. Um, but we can become intoxicated through the chanting of Hare Krishna, through devotional service. We can become intoxicated like that. We don't have to take intoxication. Now, of course, this could be more of a difficult principle to follow for some people um, because people have an attachment to different types of intoxicants. Um, but it is also possible to get free from that one um, also is included in that right cigarettes coffee tea caffeinated um, because it's a stimulant of course a lot of people will think that's very strict like oh man that's so strict um, where do you wh where do you guys get your energy where do you you know how are you supposed to function you know because people they rely on these things. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's actually surprising or it's, 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 uh, it's amazing what we can live without or what we think we need. Um, we may think we need or people may think they need so many things, but it's amazing um, what a person can live without. And one of those things is being... Uh, intoxicants and caffeine and all that. I never had a problem with caffeine. <laughs> um, one time I drank like, when I was like 16 years old or something, I drank like seven cups of coffee or whatever it was. And that was, that was, that was before a road trip. So uh, going from Oregon to California, but it just didn't make me feel good. So I wasn't attracted after that. Um, yeah, so that's, that's their intoxication. And then there's no um, uh, illicit sex. Shautram, that's cleanliness. Um, corresponds to cleanliness. So one of the aspects of cleanliness is having a uh, cleansed mind. And the cleansed mind is a mind free from all of these different lower things. Uh, you know, material, lust, greed, anger, all this type of stuff. So, this um, illicit sex or interested in you know, illicit sex, it, it, it destroys cleanliness of the mind, which also could transform into uh, ex external uncleanliness. Of course, one could be very clean externally and still be you know, attached to illicit sex, intoxication, gambling, all that, but um, yeah. Anyways, um, so this uh, illicit sex, it's like the 
it's the binding force in the material world um, means that it's something that is uh, very attractive. Um, when one hasn't fully developed their Krishna consciousness, there's some lingering attraction to it, uh, illicit sex. Um, and it's binding in the sense that just like eating of meat, intoxication, gambling is binding, these things are binding. It means they're, they're shackling to the soul because uh, the soul becomes, the mind becomes hijacked by these things. Um, just like a like a teenager boy or girl. You know, when they become a teenager boy and girl, you know, previously they didn't notice, of course now, or not now, but there's also the, the phenomenon of, you know, same-sex attraction, but the majority of people are um, still uh, opposite sex attraction. But so when a boy and girl becomes a teenager, all of a sudden they notice. The boys notice the girls, the girls notice the boys, and they become very interested all of a sudden. You know, the minds become attracted. They just can't think of anything else. And we could see that their minds become hijacked by this attraction. Um, they can't, they, 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 they don't really think about anything else. And maybe a few other things, but not much. Mostly their mind is absorbed in that. So, so the idea is that as human beings, that's built into us. It's not like, it's not unnatural to, to have such attractions. That's just, it's built in. Um, so we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't uh, call <laughs> self-flagellation. What is that? Like the Christians would do, they would. Mm -hmm. Is that what it called? How do you say that word? Yeah. I think it's flagellation, where you beat yourself with, with with sticks, and because of your your worldly <laughs> desires, right? Lusty desires. Okay, let me beat myself. Or they throw themselves in a thorn bush or something, rose bush, because of their because of their worldly desires. So we shouldn't unduly be too like like that with ourselves in regards to this because it's built in naturally but um there is an aspect of of uh of control that krishna consciousness that the philosophy of krishna consciousness advises and the only reason it's really advising any of this is that just so we could remember krishna better just so we could be more god conscious that's the only reason practically um so, so yeah, it is, uh, again, it is built in all the way from the highest living entity to the ant, you know, they're all having such desires. But again, the idea is to, is to detach ourselves from these types of desires um, as quick as possible. And definitely, if not quick, gradually to, to detach our mind and, and yeah, ourselves from these desires. Um, yeah. So another one is gambling. Uh, of course you're in Las Vegas, so a lot of that going on there, but uh, I mean, amongst the general populace. Uh, But just because there's a lot of that doesn't mean the devotees have to do that. Mm -hmm. Although there was an interesting time, actually, that the previous temple president, I don't know, you probably heard this story, but the previous temple presidents, I forgot his name, Surapal, and the other name of the lady, I forgot. But So they had the temple there, and the temple is about to close if they didn't pay the rent, something like that. 
So then they were like, okay, what are we gonna do? And this is a big problem. So they're walking down the main you know, drag there and uh, somebody was really pushing them. You know, you know how these guys are. Come in our casino, please. They practically like grabbed them by fort. Come in our casino. So they said, okay, they went in and then put your hand on this lever and, you know, go like, so they did that. And interesting enough is that they won a, quite a lot of money. And by that money, they paid, they, they continued to stay in the temple and they had a little extra to float for a little while. So, but of course that was a rare, <laughs> rare circumstance. Um, but gambling is also another intoxicating thing in that it just hijacks our consciousness and aside from that, if we're not so lucky, we're going to lose a lot. You know, you could, we could be giving that to Krishna. We could be giving that to um, saving up for our trip to India. You know, it's like you're saving up for a big trip, a pilgrimage to India. Then you come home and, oh, talking to your wife or husband about the trip to India oh so how's that trip going oh yeah good yeah so we got that four thousand dollars saved and all right sounds good and oh, oh honey I gotta tell you something uh you know I actually lost that tonight you know so it's just a waste and unnecessary so yeah the Bhagavatam says just give up you know this these these principles Hare Krishna and um and people, they, you know, people may think that, oh, I can't be happy if I give up these principles. But Srila Prabhupada would say that following these principles, it's like following the, the he would call them the regulate, regulative principles of freedom. Mm -hmm. So this is actually frees us. We feel freedom. Um, just like if one's an alcoholic, uh, if a person's an alcoholic, then their freedom is restricted. They say, I'm free. I'm a free man. I'm a free woman. I could, I could go to the liquor store and I could pick any drink I want. Right? Give me the Jack Daniels. Give me the whatever else. I don't know too many other names. <laughs> uh, so give me this drink, this drink, this drink. Okay, fine. You may have freedom to pick those drinks. But um, the question is, does that person have the freedom to say, no, I'm not picking any drinks? No, they don't. Because they're being forced by their addiction to engage in that activity. So, um, so if one is able to follow the principles, these regulative principles of freedom, then th that's exactly what they feel. They feel freedom. I'm not bound by these things, which is, which is nice. It's a nice um, feeling. And of course, not just following these principles, but then adding the chanting of Hare Krishna. So one, you're not bound, we're not bound by these principles. Two, we're chanting Hare Krishna and engaged in the process of devotional service, then we could really feel happiness. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. Um, all right, so before we continue, does anybody have any questions or comments about any of these things? Do they talk about um like, like now in this time i feel like there's even more ways to start blurring those lines like you could say like you think of gambling casino and then you could say well what about the lottery or what about um i'm like playing like certain stocks like you know we all have like retirement and funds and that's like a healthy approach right like natural but then like now do you feel like it gets pushed a lot that people like those boundaries like before regular boundaries? yeah yeah. You know, like, oh, someone say, oh, I'm baby. Well, there's no this or there's that. <laughs> you know, but then I'm, I would say, well, that's still like, and then healthy action. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat his question. So Stevie's saying that are these four principles becoming blurred? Um, for example, gambling. Say, hey, well, I'm not going to the casino and gambling. I'm just, I'm just online playing a game, and you know, there's a lot of money at stake. It's like, all right, well, that's also gambling. Um, so yeah, the principles can become blurred. Um, or he was saying, oh yeah, I'm not smoking. I'm just vaping. You know, like on the, I guess on the airplane they say, no smoking, and also including vape, right? Yeah, now, yeah. So maybe we should start adding stuff. When people get initiated. <laughs> I mean, one devotee jokes, but it's like, in because there's a lot of devotees in China now, actually. I went to China twice oh, wow. to give classes there um, to the devotees. I stayed, I think, like one time I stayed. Anyways, I, I I stayed in Hong Kong and then I went to mainland China, Shenzhen, and uh, each of those trips was at least a five day trip. So, uh, anyways, but in China, they have a tendency to, to ingest a lot of different food that m a, lot, a large part of the world wouldn't even think about uh, taking. You know, whatever it is, I don't know what they. Um, so anyways, one devotee was saying that we, you might have to add some, some at the initiation, some more, uh, things, you know, cause it's not just like meat, fish and eggs, but it could be other things, you know, Yeah. like, what do they have? I don't want to gross anybody out. But... So many things. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, you get the point. So, um, but yeah, the idea is to to not blur the lines and to um, follow. I mean, just like caffeine, someone would say, "Hey, well, I need to stay up on this road trip. It's dangerous if I don't drink caffeine." Um, but you know, there's ways of staying up without drinking caffeine. I mean, one of my friends used to get the chili, green chili. Yeah. I'll keep you up, right? Your mouth is on fire. <laughs> um, but, you know, you could roll down the window, you could put the loud music on, you could put splash water in your face, you could get more rest, maybe stop and take a rest. Um, yeah. Because a lot of the world nowadays, it, it kind of like, it's like, hey, well, I need to, I need to stay up for like 15 hours and work on my, work on my school paper. Um, of course, a lot of a lot of the world is quite passionate, and they may try to force us to do such things. But um, you know, there's a ways of getting around it. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Maybe not procrastinating to the last minute, and then you don't have to stay up for 15 hours. You know? mm -hmm. So there's ways of ways of getting around it. Um, yeah. Is there any other uh, questions or comments about any of these so far? Sorry that I didn't hear that, Tom. Uh, satyam, what does that translate to? Satyam, satyam translates to truth. Truth. So daya is mercy, tapa is austerity, shaucham is cleanliness, and satyam is truth. So truth is... Uh, is... Uh, this principle of truth is destroyed by active gambling. Because people will lie, people will cheat, people will steal. You know, when it starts coming, when money starts coming in the picture, you know, people could really uh, throw truthfulness out the window. 
just to, you know, get some more bucks, get some more money. So, yeah. Did anybody have anything else? Okay, so this is the next quote. Uh, I cannot give you protection, that is not possible. It is not very difficult to follow the four regulative principles. These things should be stopped if, if you'll want to be serious. I think it said if you, if you want to be serious, anyways. Uh, other, maybe it's, anyways. Otherwise, make a farce and do whatever you like. I cannot give you protection. This is not possible. That is not possible. So you must have to follow these rules and regulation if you're serious, then take initiation. Otherwise, don't make a farce, don't make a farce. That is my request. Mm -hmm. Next quote, my, dis my advice is always chant 16 rounds minimum and follow the four regulative principles. All of my disciples must agree on this point. Otherwise, they're not my disciples. My disciples must follow these principles live in either in heaven or hell. So it means through thick and thin, all the principles. Okay. Uh, okay, so there's, uh, I think Stevie has a question before we. Oh, no, I was just, I was just okay. reading it out loud. All right, so the next one is, this is a writing exercise. So we could write in the box below. Write in the box below some helpful solutions to challenges faced in strictly following initiation vows. So if people have challenges, what are some uh, helpful solutions to uh, help with them? Would anyone like to share? All right, Pawan. One of the things is I'll repeat what he says. Yeah, help me please to stay in the association of the beauty as far as possible. And second is to avoid such situation or association where these rights are you know, rich to be broken. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so Paul Wan was saying that, um, he was saying that some solutions to challenges facing Shigli Fallen initiation verse, he was saying that to some challenges that may be faced is that, all right, let, first of all, let's just say that there's a challenge. So then he's saying that, all right, well, instead of keeping oneself in the association of non-devotees or people who aren't interested in Krishna consciousness, or as Prabhupada says, people who are yeah, not interested in Krishna consciousness, worldly persons, um, those people will encourage us directly or indirectly to break the principles. Um, so, so a solution to that would be to associate with devotees. Um, because the devotees, uh, generally speaking, after the Sunday feast, you know, they're not gonna come out and say, hey, you know, I wanna go to the parking lot and have a drink. Uh, generally speaking, they don't do that. Although I've heard about it <laughs> before. Um, they actually did it with one of our brahmacharis. It's kind of very strange, actually. We were having like a community family picnic. That's what they called it. A community family, like New Goverdon, San Diego Iscon picnic. And then, you know, there's a number of devotees. There are a lot of devotees, probably 75 devotees. And then one of the brahmacharis, years later, he told me this because he moved out of the temple. But years later, he told me that, yeah, when I was at that community gathering, somebody um, somebody invited me out to the parking lot, you know, and we, whatever, they, they drank something or whatever. So, so but anyways, but generally speaking, <laughs> if we associate with devotees, then, um, then, then they won't encourage like that, so. So that's a solution. Yeah. But you say, oh, I'm having a hard time following the principles. You know, I, I just have a hard time finding the principles. And it's like, oh, well, what are you doing that's giving you a hard time? Well, my, my buddies, they invite me, you know, to whatever, to go hang out with them every Friday. And they're all sitting around drinking and smoking or whatever they're doing. So naturally, one may have a hard time following. Of course, there's some people who just, they could sit there and, you know, doesn't really bother them, but but yeah. Anyway, so that's a solution to associate more with devotees who won't encourage us to do such things. Um, I think you had some. You'd like to share something, Dan? Like me? Uh, well, I did write a few things down. And I am having like a, I'm actually down to a cup of like half calf a day. And I have been caffeine free before, but that seems to be my big thing. But, you know, because it's just really social, like, oh, let's go and have a coffee. Let's do this. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, but the coffee shops, guess what? They have decaf. They have decaffeinated stuff. They have water. You know, I think you have to, I, for me, I have to get out of my own head. Like, you can still go socialize at the coffee shop without drinking coffee, you know? Yeah. But then, like, I I actually have a really good example for this because I went this weekend, um, or Thursday through Saturday to Atlanta. Well, I went with work. Well, a lot of, I would say, out of the 23 people, like 21 of the 23 are drinkers. You know, there's me and a Mormon lady. And so <laughs> I just made other I made other plans. I actually went online and I reached out to the Bhakti community and I was like, I want to be in Atlanta, you know, would somebody like to meet? And I met a lady who also, you know, is a just aspiring devotee. And we went out and it was nice because I didn't have to worry about drinking. I didn't have to, and we just, we had a great time. And then I nice. met, and I made, um, I went to the temple there in Atlanta and, so, you know, on my own, I took the Uber and I went. And I think a lot of, following these is you just you got to be strong about your resolve and you got to say you know what 
all right, y'all are going to go out drinking. Bye. I'm going to go do something else. You know, and I think I'm I'm fortunate because I'm older. So I'm not, I don't have that social pressure of like younger people, you know? So, but it's like, I think you have to be strong (laughs) with with that. And then one of the other things with gambling, I just forget, like I played uh, Super Bowl squares where you pick the squares and like with the score, luckily I didn't win. But sometimes the gambling, I just like, oh, or I picked up, yeah, I was camping and I picked up a lottery ticket. Just, you know, so I guess I just have to be conscious of like, pay attention to what I'm doing. So yeah, and then I'm being in something good with that. And then like with the intimacy thing, I think because I'm single right now, I could anticipate that being a problem if I started dating, like, no, we sorry, we can't do that yet. You know, but I think if you find people that also stuttering bhakti, you know, that's not going to be as big of a thing, the intimacy. They're going to be more want to know like who you are and and help you build a relationship with Krishna and you're going to do the same for them. And then that kind of isn't as important. I mean, that would be my guess in my life. So there you go. There's my share. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's important. The association we keep, you know, is very important for the company that could make all the difference in the world. Um, but yeah, we should have a resolve follow um yeah there was one devotee he used to um you know there's a radio that went on on the altar for some weird reason we're right near the altar here like behind me is the altar but the radio went on which is not supposed to go on so and it's a little disturbing and aside from that that's not supposed to be on right now. And it's just some random radio station. So I'm just going to get up real quick. I'll be right back. I'm just going to change just one second. Is Yeah, there was one devotee. He uh, is an Indian man and living in India. And all of his friends, they would like, you know, he because he was a, he was like an industrialist guy, and you know, he, he had to go to these company uh, meetings at restaurants and stuff. So what he would do is, uh, you know, everybody's drinking and whatever. So what he would do is he would get a cup or get a glass and he'd fill it up with, you know, seven up or something like that. But it looked like a, you know, glass that you drink alcohol out of. And he would, you know, go around sipping that. And then he would, um, he would uh, tell the, the people that, oh, I'm allergic. You know, I'm allergic to meat, fish and eggs. So I just, I can't take any of it, you know. Um, and he would do things like that. So, so he was socializing with them, but he was just saying, oh, you know, this doesn't agree with me, you know? Um, I mean, he would kind of fake the alcohol thing, but he would say I was allergic to meat, fish, and eggs. But, um, so a lot of the times people respect that. If you say, hey, you know, this actually, you know, I'm here to socialize with you. I'm here to talk with you, but I just can't, you know, I can't drink this. I can't, it just doesn't agree with me. I mean, you don't have to say, oh, I'm allergic, you know, say, oh, it doesn't agree with me. It doesn't make me feel good. makes me feel sick. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to drink some orange juice or I'm going to, whatever. So there's ways of kind of, 
What, what do you so, think about that, though? I mean, I guess it's just, it seems really unfortunate that we, that you have to do that, you know, that you have to pretend. To, I mean, I know it's the, the environment that we're living in, but, you know, it just, it seems really unfortunate that you have to lie, that you're, that you're, or pretend to drink to fit in. I mean, I think it's a process because I just actually this summer, like kind of let people know that I, you know, I study bhakti and I'm just going to the temple. And so like, I think maybe it's a process where you feel more comfortable, but I don't know. And I'm also a teacher. So I, I have more, you know, I have like these business people that I have to kind of impress or whatever, you know, yeah. but it seems unfortunate that we have to lie. Well, about, well, even at this conference, they were making jokes about drinking. I mean, drinking is so common that it's like so interwoven. It's just pretty gross, really. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, the thing is, there's different ways. Like the reason why this devotee was doing that is because everybody was like pretty much harassing him. Oh, you don't drink. And oh, you should drink. And why don't you here? Take a drink, man. It's just like give me a break. Like, I don't drink. I don't want to drink. Like, leave me alone. So the only reason he did that was to kind of like get the people away from, you know, stop bothering him. So I, I forgot to point, point that out. And similar with the meat, fish and eggs. Oh yeah. Why are you so strict? And you know, what does it matter? And this and that, and, you know, why, you know, but if he was said, Hey, I'm allergic. And they said, okay, sure. I, I respect that. You're allergic. Okay. You know? So it's kind of, um, yeah, I've, been, I've been vegan for like five and a half years and yeah I went through that stage too where it was just easier and I have people still it's five and a half years later and I still have people going are you still doing that vegan thing I'm like yes <laughs> I know sometimes it is it's just easier just to, to do that yeah but you know there's some people like myself people ask me about it and you know I'm dressed like this and I'll just tell them, you know, I, I just choose not to do certain things. And, you know, generally they're okay with it. Um, they don't really give me a hard time about it. So there's different ways of going about it. You don't have to go that route, but that is a route. There's other ways you could just say, hey, no, I don't do it. These are the reasons why I don't do it. You know, and that's it. <laughs> so you had something, Tom? Yeah, I just wanted to add like, as far as like, I mean, eating, like, without, uh, you know, I had a, I had a bad problem for five years now, but even, even I've had good friends that while I was at my worst would tell me, you know, you need to either stop or calm down. You have a problem. But then when I did, it was like, so you're never going to drink again. Like I, I can't have a beer with you no more. And, it was, it's weird. It's almost like they have this, this thought that like, you think they're better than them. I don't know what it is. So it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a walking on eggshells kind of thing. Cause even like the meat eating was kind of like that. Like people kind of, if you explain why you do it, even if it's not for a spiritual or religious thing, they almost like automatically take offense to it. Like they think that you're better than them because you decided not to eat meat because of whatever reason, or you decided that you were too good for alcohol. So sometimes even trying to explain it, it's it rough because it makes them feel a certain way about, you know, why so, you're not doing it. And yeah. So I don't know. It's, it's just kind of, I very, uh, very passionate about, you know, that, you know, the drink and alcohol and eat meat because I've been through this for so long with people who, like I said, it's almost like they take offense to it. You know, without you trying to be offensive, they're inquiring about it. But yeah. The answers. Yeah, because people are um, a lot of the times attached to being right, um, even if they're, you know, they might not be of the highest moral character, but it's almost like a built-in human tendency to like want to be right um so if we say yeah hey man i you know i gave up drinking i gave up meat eating and then they're still doing it it's like it's like they're like why you know are 
it's it's almost like are are you are you questioning that I'm wrong? Like what I'm yeah. doing is wrong because um, they, they they feel a challenge. They feel it. They feel it as a challenge um, to them. So yeah, it could be a little difficult to uh, deal with that. But generally, I found that if you're just friendly and humble with them, then usually people don't. You know, they may get a little kind of. Of course, it's depending on circumstance and people. But well, you know, um, ultimately, you're generally interested too. You know, when you, you say you don't eat meat no more after you've eaten meat for 30 years or something, or you've drank for so long and that's what they know you to do, they're generally interested as to what made you make that decision, which is good because, you know, really I have no problem sharing those things. It's just there's those few people that feel like you're taking a stab at them or something. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, sometimes it's interesting being a devotee. Paul, one he has a yeah. comment. I'll re I'll repeat it. And the, um, like at least as an Indian, kind of keep questioning, right? Like, because you get a sense of isolation. Like you repeatedly say that I don't, that I don't, and people are stopping watching you for any social getting because they know that they can't do any social support, right? Just for one person, they're not gonna just, you know, without only and garlic, especially you apply that principle, right? Or, you know, not offer food. Once you get used to it, it's not gonna be good. So then it's like, it's strict isolation. So what helped, like, at least at this point, what I think when we get into that situation, man, you know, the fear comes from sense of losing social status and and at, at workplace, it's more of fear of retaliation, of you know, promotion, not job or growth, right? But that's what people work for. Yeah. So I mean, at least I talk to my wife and people, maybe if Krishna wants whatever he wants, it will happen, right? So probably it's more of surrendering more and having like imposing that thing that it let's follow whatever happens, happens right? Yeah. Thinking of long term rather than short term. Yeah. Gains. Yeah. Yeah. So Paula was saying that if we tell people, "Oh, I don't eat meat, I don't drink this and that," you know, they may not invite us to their social gatherings, you know, because that's what everybody's doing there. So then you might find a sense of isolation, and so it could be difficult to deal with that. Similarly, with the workplace, they find out we don't eat meat or drink or anything like that then they might retaliate or you know not give the guy not give a prom promotion or whatever it may be you know so how to deal with all that well um the idea is just to follow i mean we can't not follow the truth because um because people don't like it you know we have to follow the truth because it's the truth. It's important. It's it's valuable. We follow it because it should be done. And however anybody else really wants to 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 uh, to think of it, that's kind of their problem. <laughs> um, it's not really our problem. Um, and if somebody, if we don't get the promotion, well. Maybe it's better we didn't get the promotion. At least we followed the truth. We could have not followed the truth or kind of kind of blurred the lines a little bit to 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 make our way materially, but what's the use of that? Or even if people don't 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 invite us to their social gatherings so much, maybe that's good for our consciousness. One more time. Temple. No, we could go <laughs> go hang out with devotees, or right. we could go. We could read more about Krishna consciousness, or we could. There's so many things we could do. Because a lot of the times, just just associating with certain people, even if it's at a social obligation, it could be very disturbing actually to the mind. Mm -hmm. um, means if we're like if we're chanting our job every day, if we're trying to be Krishna conscious, right, or if we're being Krishna conscious. Then we have these social obligations. We go to some party or this or that out of social obligation. It would be very disturbing to the mind. 
what people listen to, what people talk about. Um, because the power of words, they're extremely impactful on our consciousness. Mm -hmm. So somebody just, you just overhear a conversation or whatever, it's just, it could be really distracting. So, uh, yeah, sometimes if they don't, or if they don't invite us on the basis that they can't, what do you call, cater to our needs, or they don't really want us around because we're not eating meat or drinking alcohol, you know, that may be something we have to uh, deal with. But according to the individual, they have different types of social obligations. They have maybe where they work, they're, they're the people, the coworkers invite them, or maybe their family gatherings. So at family gatherings, what I do, I go to family gatherings. Um, and <laughs> they may think it's kind of strange, but <laughs> I don't know what my grandmother thinks, but I go there and I just like, well, specifically when they kind of bring out all of the things that are against principles of terms of eating, I just, it's usually on a, on a Christmas day or a day like that. I just kind of step out of the room and I say, oh, I'm going to go call my sister and see how she's doing on this Christmas day or whatever. And I call, step out, call. And so it's not, I'm just kind of running away. I'm just, I'm just calling my sister, you know, or another family member. And then, um, you know, I bring them prasadam. I bring them Cook, I bring cookies, you know, offer to Krishna and garlands from the deities. And, and sometimes I cook the, I, I'll make the main means, I'll cater the event um, according to their likes, because not everybody likes like, you know, pure Indian food, you know, so, but maybe they do, some people do. So, but according to their like, I'll cater something, you know, like we made pizza here before, brought it there, um, offered it to Krishna. We made grunga potatoes, many things. So uh, that's also an option. Bringing prasadam. Americans seem to like cookies. It's like a built-in American <laughs> like usually. So making cookies and offering to people at these social obligations. So anyways, but there's different ways of going about it, so. All right. Okay, so we'll read two more quotes on page 39. If you still are unable to fulfill that promise to your spiritual master, then what is the use of calling your, yourself devotee and disciple? That is simply pretending. So you should think like this, that I have promised my spiritual master this, and I must obey him without any exception. Otherwise, I have no business calling myself his disciple. That will be your austerity or tapasya, for forcing you to make very rapid advancement in Krishna conscious understanding. Without tapasya, there's no question of making advancement. You must avoid these four basic principle restrictions under all circumstances without any exceptions. Of course, once, twice, Krishna may excuse. That is not very difficult. The more than that will be very difficult for Krishna to excuse you, and there is a great risk that everything will be lost despite all of your time and effort spent. So there's room for mistakes um, because to err is human to forgive is divine, right? So there's room for mistakes, um, but, but ultimately um, a devotee should strive to be beyond mistakes, um, all different types of mistakes actually. And the biggest mistake is forgetting Krishna. <laughs> uh, so, all these other small, all these other mistakes that a devotee could make in their life, it's just really resulting in the biggest mistake, which is forgetting Krishna. Um, and getting getting absorbed in gambling or whatever it may be, all these different principles or all the different ways in which we could forget Krishna. 
that's the mistake the mistake um so we should get to the point where we don't make mistakes, which means we're always remembering Krishna. We're always Krishna conscious. We're always experiencing the ecstasy of Krishna consciousness. And then we don't have attraction to any of these things. Or if we do have some lingering attraction, it's not strong enough to really take us away from Krishna. So we got to get to the, we should be at the level where we always go back to Krishna. Sometimes people, they make a mistake, and that mistake continues for one year, five year, 10 year, 15 year, the whole life sometimes. That's called a really big mistake. Sometimes people make mistake and they, you know, they kind of go off for a few months and they come back or they go off for a few years, they come back. But the idea is just to, we may make mistakes but to always go back to Krishna and then eventually just be at the level where we practically don't make mistakes and we're just always in Krishna consciousness. So, um, yeah. And last quote on 39, you have asked if it is true that the spiritual master remains in the material universe until all of his disciples are transferred to the spiritual sky. The answer is yes, this is the rule. Therefore, every student should be very much careful not to commit any offense which will be detrimental to his promotion to the spiritual kingdom and thereby the spiritual master has to incarnate again to deliver him. This sort of mentality will be a kind of offense to the spiritual master. Out of 10 kinds of offenses, the number one offense is to disobey the orders of the guru. The instructions given to the disciple by the spiritual master at the time of initiation should be strictly followed, that will make one advance to the path, spiritual path. But if one deliberately defies such instructions, then his advancement is hampered from the very beginning. This defined means to disconnect the relationship with the guru, and anyone who defies and therefore disconnects the relationship with the guru can hardly expect the distance of the spiritual master life after life. I hope this will clear up this question sufficiently for you. All right, any other the additional quotes on page 40 you could read on your free time? If you like. Okay, so does anybody have any questions before we go to eight? Lesson eight? No, okay. All right, lesson eight, here we go, We're making progress, making progress. Okay, so here's some verses. This is regular worship of Prabhupada, the importance of Guru Puja. Puja means worship, Puja means worship. Formal worship of Iskon Gurus and Vyasa Puja. Vyasa Puja is the birthday of the spiritual master. So here's some verses. The spiritual master is honored as much as Krishna because he is the most confidential servitor of the Lord. Lord Shiva told Durga, my dear Devi, although the Vedas recommend worship of demigods, the worship of Vishnu is taught most. However, above the worship of Lord Vishnu is the rendering of service to Vaishnavas who are related to Lord Krishna. Krishna told Arjun, those who are my direct devotees are actually not my devotees, but those who are devotees of my servant are factually my devotees. So this Guru Puja, which we're doing, is not self-aggrandizement. It is real teaching. You should you sing daily. What is that? Guru Mukha Padma Vakit Aryanakari Aikya. Bas, this is translation. Bas means finished. I have, I tell you frankly, whatever little success is there in this Krishna consciousness movement, I simply believe what, my, what was spoken by my guru, Maharaj. You also continue what you also continue that. Then every success will then every success will come. So the guru is honored as much as Krishna because he's the most confidential servitor of Krishna. 
So that's the first point. Or as Prabhupada would say, love me, love my dog. Means that if someone says, oh, I love you, means love my dog, means if, like if someone's on the street, they're walking their dog and a man comes up and starts and feeds the dog some dog treats, right? Very nice to the dog. Then the, ma the master of the dog or the right, owner of the dog will be very um, happy. Oh, he's treating my dog very nicely, mm -hmm. right? It's not that, uh, sorry for the graphic, uh, but it's not that a man comes up on the street and, you know, he comes up, kicks the dog and, and he tells the master, oh, how are you doing, buddy? You know, nice to see you today. And here, shake my hand. And, you know, I really love you. Really love you, pal. And, um, so, so it's a similar principle. We can't say, I love you, Krishna. But then with the servants of Krishna, we just, whatever, push them around, kick them around, mistreat them, offend them, criticize them especially the guru. Um, so we have to be very uh, respectful as much as we would to Krishna, the guru. And Shiva tells Durga, his wife, that best is worship of Vishnu, but even more better is, is um, worshiping things that are in relation to Vishnu, means devotees. That's what Shiva tells Durga. And Krishna says to Arjuna that those who are my devotees are not my devotees, but those who are devotees of my servant are my devotees. So this is making the Krishna is making the point that if someone wants to say they're a devotee, then they should actually they should actually be devotees of other devotees. Servants of other devotees means um, it's not like a servant. We serve in different ways. Uh, for one devotee, we may act as a mentor. For another devotee, we may, they may act as our mentor, means we inquire from them. That's also a way of serving devotees is to inquire from them. If the gurus, if everybody stopped inquiring to the gurus, what would the gurus do with their time, right? <laughs> Guru means they have to speak. So it's a service actually to ask gurus questions because then they could serve by answering the questions. Uh, we may serve devotees prasadam. We may buy gifts for devotees. We may uh, invite devotees to our home and have kirtan and prasadam and have friendship with devotees. It's a good way to serve devotees. So there's so many ways we could serve mentally, emotionally. We see a devotee has some holy socks and say, hey, Prabhu, I saw you had some holy socks. I just got you these pair of socks, you know. Holy means, holy means like <laughs> they have holes in them. <laughs> say, hey, I got you these socks. You know, Merry Christmas. Um, so there's different ways we could serve, but it's important, Krishna says. And then therefore there's a principle of Guru Puja. Uh, we're worshiping Prabhupada. We're worshiping our guru. And based on all of these scriptural references. So there's a writing exercise here. Um, based on everybody's ideas and thoughts in this regard. Uh, what are some benefits of regular uh, guru puja? The worship of the guru. What are some benefits? So that's a writing exercise. We'll do.
Would Stevie like to share? Um, I put the main, the main thing I focused on was that developing that deeper connection with my guru. So for me, aspiring for the guru, I still, for me, would be Prabhupada and spending time in honor because I'm here because of Prabhupada. There's no other way I'm here. So I believe that guru worship is what deepens my connection until I take someday if I'm blessed to take initiation. But for now, it's Prabhupada, but it's that deeper connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's saying that by worship of the guru, one develops more of a connection with with the guru. So, yeah, that's true. Um, we worship Prabhupada, you know, as our guru, means Shiksha guru. Prabhupada's not our Diksha guru. Um, that's Ritvik ism. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Prabhupada's our Shiksha Guru, he's our instructing guru. And uh, we worship him and we, we can develop more of a connection to him, feel more connected to him. Same with our with our gurus as well. Mm -hmm. we, we may be aspiring for a particular guru to take initiation from so we could offer worship to him and feel more connected. Now, of course, we should get to the point that we actually have faith because worship without faith could be really weird. <laughs> um, like we have to have faith. Like we shouldn't, we shouldn't actually, you could say we could try to get to the point where we, especially with our, with our gurus, it's like if they're worshipful personalities, we should understand why they're worshipful, just like Sri the Prabhupada. Devotees accept Prabhupada as a worshipable personality. That's true. But um, it's very helpful to, to increase our knowledge of Srila Prabhupada because then we'll feel more inspired to, 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 to worship him. It means, um, that's how I say, well, well, why do I need to feel more inspired to worship him? Oh, it's like, okay, well, you don't necessarily have to feel inspired to worship him, but if you're engaged in the process of worshiping Sri the Prabhupada or meditating on Sri the Prabhupada, right. it makes sense to know as much as possible about him. So you, you feel more, there's, there's more of a reason to, or else it becomes a bit of a, what do you call like a, um, in some cases, of course, I don't think that most devotees are in this category, but like a personality cult means that they don't, they may have some general idea of this person being charismatic, but they don't know much about him. And they just worship him on the, on the basis of whatever. You know? So, um, so we don't want that to happen with our gurus, like with Prabhupada or our gurus. Um, in other words, the, 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 what do you call, the um, injunction that we should worship is there. So as followers of bhakti, followers of Krishna consciousness, we have to live with that injunction means we're all devotees here. So we have to live with that injunction. Hey, you're spo we're supposed to worship the gurus, right? So, all right, well, but how are we supposed to digest that point? We're supposed to worship the gurus. Because that's, it's kind of a, it could be a difficult point actually to like fully accept that. I have to worship a guru. I have to worship Prabhupada. You know, because most, a lot of people, they think, hey, well, all right, I may respect, I may have appreciation for, but worship, that's too much, you know. So how are we supposed to live with this injunction? Well, we live with it by understanding, by developing more and more and more our understanding of the worshipable nature of these personalities. 
or else, you know, time will go on. We're like, what am I worshiping Prabhupada for? What is, what am I doing? Or what am I worshiping my guru for? You know, if we don't understand the, 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 the glories or the worshipful nature. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's important. Um, and therefore one should not take initiation from somebody they're not inspired by. Mm -hmm. You know, it shouldn't be like, oh, I'm mildly inspired by this person. Let me take initiation. You know, we should be like really inspired by them to the point where we have faith in them and the point where we actually feel comfortable um, worshiping this person as a devotee, not as. And the thing is, because generally you think like a worship, you know, it's the thing that's kind of weird sometimes in the sense that, oh, does that mean that that person wants to be worshiped, you know? Is it is it like on some ego trip? You know, the guru wants to. Hey, put my picture up in your room, and you're on your altar. And, you know, bow down to my picture and all this type of stuff. But it's not that the guru is on an ego trip at all. If they're on an ego trip, they're not a guru or they're not very good guru. You know. Um, but the guru is just doing it as a service. I'm a teacher. I'm a servant of you. Um, it is my service to, to, to guide you, to help you, to um, see that you're doing well. And this is the, this is the system that Krishna set up. Um, and I'm just doing this as a service. And I'm not taking any um, selfish pleasure in it, you know, having my picture up or any et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this is just the Krishna system that Krishna set up and um, and I'm just doing this as a service. So um, that should be the idea. So there has to be a proper understanding on the guru's part and there has to be a proper understanding on the disciples part or else things get a little strange. Um, so yeah, but we should be convinced. Um, so. Those are some points. Does anybody have any questions or comments about any of this? I have kind of a question comment. For some reason, I got it in my head that like um, doing your guru puja is like practicing how you would like um, worship in Krishna. Because I have... And I know some, someone said a story about them bringing a glass of water and the water had like drips all down the side to their guru. And I don't know if it was Prabhupada or another guru. And they, and they were, the guru was really upset. Like, you know, how could you bring that to me? Or would you bring it to Krishna like that? Or they said something. So like when I do that, when I'm like, you know, offer Krishna some water on the altar, I always make sure like it's, Right. And I, I don't know, is that true that it's kind of like yeah. practicing? Yeah, it's it's the guru trains us. And what is he training us to do? He's training us in being conscious and being um, having the right motives, um, doing things properly, uh, not for his own, you know, selfish pleasure, but he's just training us how to be um, Krishna conscious, training us how to serve Krishna. Um, I've had a ex number of experiences of serving my guru, um, like means personally, of course, whatever I do, I try to see as a service to him. So like this, this, this kind of disciple course right now, I try to see it as a service to him and a service to all of you. But, um, but, but, there's, but there's an aspect of doing personal service means may, I, I, I would sometimes, um, you know, I'd clean his room or I would serve him prasadam, you know, lunch or something like that, help, help in the cooking process, something like that. So yeah, there was a number of times where I was doing that like I was serving him lunch, which is a very humbling thing, actually. 
just you know somebody's sitting there and you're, you're standing there you may be tired you may be hungry you may be whatever or you're just standing there and you're and you're serving them lunch and you're you know they're wait you're waiting there do you need anything else you know it's it's a humbling situation um but i remember a, a number of times thinking to myself while i was serving him i was thinking this is so nice because he's actually teaching me how to be humble mm -hmm. and without being humble how will i how will i approach krishna if i'm not humble how am i supposed to approach krishna 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 is not interested in proud one of my friends told me that uh, Krishna hates pride more than he hates lust, which makes sense. But um, so the guru trains us how to be humble practically. And he's able to do that because he was trained how to be humble. Like my teacher, for example, was, was um, trained uh, by Srila Prabhupada. Um, and, and in many, in many ways, quite personally, uh, Srila Prabhupada spent, I think it was like 550 days, which is a long time at the particular temple. My guru was, or, uh, yeah, my spiritual master was managing, uh, Juhu. Uh, India so and 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 he was the temple president there so Prabhupada was personally training him you know how to do things how to so um so and 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 many times it was you know Prabhupada would correct him and you know things like that and so he was trained you could say how to be humble so and he's very humble mm -hmm. So then when I'm serving him, uh, he's training me how to be humble. Or else how will I learn how to call out to Krishna? How will I ever approach Krishna? How will I ever properly associate with devotees if I'm not humble? So that's the value. So yeah, the guru does help with that. Okay, so. Let's we'll read a few more quotes here. All right. After after this, it is some details. You don't have to remember all these. De I mean, you you could we could try to remember all these details, but there might be a lot. But the essence of them you could focus on. After chanting the pranam mantra of their diksha guru, every guru has a mantra, like a specific mantra. I think we discussed that. All grand disciples and future generations should chant at least the first of Srila Prabhupada's pranam mantras while offering obeisances as a means of respecting the founder of Charya. My policy is I just chant both. It doesn't take much longer. Personally, I think it's better. So that's I always add that into the, <laughs> the disciple courses that I'm teaching. Me disagreeing with uh, or speaking against this calm law here, you know, got me on camera talking against, but, but we could chant both. Namo Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane. Okay, that's the first part. Namaste Saraswati Devi Gaudavani Pracharade Nirvishesha Srinivari Pashtate Adeshitarane. Doesn't take much longer, so anyways, that's my personal. All right. While performing arti in the temple or at the temple-related functions, a pujari may keep a small picture of his or her diksha guru on the arti tray or table instead of on the altar, provided the diksha guru is an ISKCON-approved guru and of good standing. The picture of the diksha guru should be smaller in size than the picture of Srila Prabhupada on the altar, and it shall be removed after the arti. So that's when you start doing worship on the altar. You, you could keep a smaller picture of Prabhupada, I mean, excuse me, of your guru. And the reason being is because in the past, there's been a heavy minimization of Prabhupada, either consciously or otherwise. Um, so they're, 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 they're a little careful in this regard nowadays. 
The disciples of Iskand gurus, other than Prabhupada, may offer Guru Puja to their gurus outside the temple room. So these are details like on Vyasa Puja Day, the day of the spiritual master, the birthday. There's actually a ceremony in which the guru is appreciated and so many words by the disciples and so on. So he's saying that that ceremony can take place outside of a temple room somewhere else. No one in ISKCON will be addressed publicly with the honorific terrific title, His Divine Grace, nor be addressed either public or privately by the honorific, honorifics ending in Pada or Deva. Disciples may address their ISKCON Diksha Shiksha Gurus as Guru Dev or Guru Maharaj. So in the past, there was a lot of honorific titles given to Gurus, His Divine Grace, um, Vishnu Pada, uh, so many different titles. So Iskan's law is that um, just to uh, call our spiritual masters either Guru Dev or Guru Maharaj. Yeah, Guru. Yeah, Guru Dev, Guru Maharaj, those are the two titles. Like Indra Yumna Swami, those of you who know him, he goes by Guru Dev. His disciples call him that. Um, my guru, his disciples call him Guru Maharaj. So he's different. Events welcoming Vaishnavas, including those serving as gurus to Iskand Temple, should be modest. For example, offering of a sitting place, offering of prasadam and something to drink, presentation of the garland, performance of kirtan. Um, has anybody attended a Vyasa Puja ceremony here? I don't think. And now we have a Vyasa Puja ceremony of Srila Prabhupada that happens the day after Janmashtami. Yeah, so that day devotees may have attended and it's the birthday of Srila Prabhupada, that's Vyasa Puja. So if you have attended that birthday of Srila Prabhupada, then it says here there's a writing exercise, note down some reflections about attending the Vyasa Puja ceremony. So if you had attend one, such as Srila Prabhupada, you could write. And if not, then you don't have to write. We'll take a few minutes to...
So would someone like to share? What about Tom? Sounds like a TV show, huh? What about Tom? <laughs> I think it's um, been to one by us for probably uh, last last year. Um, I didn't write all that down, but I do remember um, everybody who felt they need wanted to speak about Prabhupada and what he had, what they had meant, you know, he had meant to them. Uh, just listening to everybody and all the all the wonderful things they had to say, just sucking all that in. Um, that was the first time too I had heard Prabhupada's Bayas Puja Kirtan, so we got to read it as everybody's singing it. It's like one of the only, you know, because we're so used to doing RT every Sunday where it's to Krishna, so we kind of, you know, over repeated weeks and weeks we've learned all these prayers. So to to hear the one that was for Prabhupada was uh, was nice because you know. A lot of times we try to keep up, so to, to hear it for the first time was was lovely. And just uh, I remember feeling like, you know, we were doing it in front of the, the Prabhupada deity, and I just remember feeling like like that was him, which it, it was, you know. But it was just I remember looking at the deity, thinking like of like almost waiting for him to move, <laughs> you know, like he was he was there. That was him. But it was uh, it was it was beautiful. I do remember just. Right just absorbing all of that and it in. Nice. Nice. Nice reflection. Yeah, the awesome puja ceremonies are very um, very inspiring. Prabhupada's very inspiring. Also other gurus, if you have the chance to attend their Vyasa Puja, it's also very inspiring. I mean especially if you have some uh, attraction and you know faith in that person it's a very emotional day emotional a lot of the times devotees may cry when they um when they give their offering i remember one year sorry to use myself example but <laughs> i was here and i i usually don't do this and i wasn't planning on doing it but i started to speak and I was speaking for a little bit and then I just started to cry a lot. I was still trying to speak. I wasn't just up there crying, but I was trying to speak as well while I was crying. But eventually I managed to get something out. But um, anyways, I usually don't do that. But it was, a, yeah, but it, it's a very emotional day. But a lot of people do that. It's like very common. You know, people will cry in Vyasa Puja days. I remember... We had this Vyasa Puja of my guru. It was during lockdown. Sorry to remind people of those days. But uh, um, we had a Vyasa Puja. And what it was, it was a worldwide Vyasa Puja. So it, we had sessions, you know, the devotees in Australia, New Zealand would speak, then the devotees in India would speak, and then the devotees in America would speak, then the devotees in, you know, all over the world, they would take turns speaking. And this went on, this went on for like at least a week. And each session was very long. It was like hours long, you know, because people were giving their offerings. <laughs> And I think America was like the last. Uh, so I was, I was one of the last ones who spoke. Um, but anyways, my guru was sitting there hearing everybody for days, you know, talking about, you know, how, how, he, how he helped them and how he changed their lives and so on, which I thought was very nice. It was very nice, actually. And we were thinking of doing, doing one like that, I think, last year. But we couldn't do it because, you know, the world opened back up and everybody's busy working this, that. So that, that was like an interesting opportunity we have. Um, so, but one thing about that ceremony is that I was very surprised. In some ways, not surprised because it's in some ways common, but just because 
like so many devotees were crying when they're giving their offerings, like a lot. Um, so it was nice to see that. And I didn't take it as just some sentimental, you know, type of thing. But, you know, they felt like this person, you know, helped me. So it was, it was really nice. So, yeah, we could attend Prabhupada's, we could attend uh, other gurus, we ask pujas. Okay, so there's just a few more quotes here. In order to focus more fully on Prabhupada and every devotee's special relationship with him in ISKCON, Shikshur Diksha Guru may accept public Guru Puja, RT, and or foot bathing. It's a it's a it's a Vedic tradition. Um, somehow or other, uh, washing of the it's called foot bathing. So disciples will watch wash the um, feet of their guru with water and other things. Um, actually, Krishna did this with Sudama Brahman. And in the Krishna book, there were childhood friends. So Sudama Brahman came to see Krishna. Krishna sat him down and he washed his feet. So it's a it's a Vedic tradition offering respectable personalities that um, and in person once a year on ISKCON property on his or her Vyasa Puja. This celebration may be held in the temple room. ISKCON members conducting Vyasa Puja ceremonies for ISKCON Guru shall observe them in a modest way, significantly less elaborate than Srila Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja. Means again, they just don't want to minim they don't want to minim minimize Srila Prabhupada. So but according to the means, you know, devotees could have a awesome festival for their guru, and then they could have a more awesome festival for Prabhupada. Or a the, the guru shouldn't be more awesome. That's the point. It has to be. Prabhupada should actually be, you know, some notches up at least. But Again, this was just from the whole 80s and minimizing Prabhupada. So, um, all right. ISKCON members conducted best British ceremonies for ISKCON Guru shall observe in a modest way, in a modest way, significantly less elaborate than should Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja. In general, devotees shall observe these Vyasa Puja celebrations in their own locales. In ISKCON, Vyasa Puja books may be published only for Sri Prabhupada. So, Vyasa Puja books are books that our offerings to Srila Prabhupada or whoever's appearance day it is. So they're saying that just make ones for Prabhupada that are printed books. So it is generally considered a violation of Vaishnava etiquette for disciples to request the spiritual masters, God brothers or sisters to write an offering for, offer praise during or participate in the Asa Puja ceremony for their spiritual master. So sometimes the the, the, the God sisters or God brothers may attend the spiritual masters Vyasa Puja, but he's saying generally they don't. Um, the Vyasa Pujas I attended of my guru, his God brothers and sisters were there, a number of them, and he would he would you know make sure that they get gifts and garlands, and so it wasn't that he was the one accepting all the garlands and gifts, but they would get garlands, they would get gifts, they would. You know, this kind of member shall celebrate Srila Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja ceremony as the preeminent Vyasa Puja ceremony in ISKCON. Most important, all ISKCON members are requested to write an annual Vyasa Puja offering to Srila Prabhupada. So we can write an offering to Prabhupada. So there's some additional quotes, but you could read those on your free time. Okay, so we have some lesson nine, lesson 10. Lesson 11, 12, 13. So what's the date of next Sunday? That's August, is it August 7th? 7th. August 7th. 
It's July 31st. Okay, good. Good. So then we'll meet July 31st. But August 7th, we have how there's 13 lessons. Okay, so yeah, August 7th is the Ralph Theatre in Los Angeles. So we can um, we could postpone that day for that function, but next week we can meet. And we should be able to, we should be able to complete these in the next two Sundays. Um, yeah, so that's like August 14th or yeah. something. So we should be able to complete it then. So next week, and then August 7th, we won't meet, and the following week we'll meet, and we should be able to complete it that day. And I know there's five left lessons left, and we usually do four. Actually, we usually do two per lesson, but one of those days, I think we could manage to do three um, in the time limit we usually meet. Like now we have 15 minutes kind of 15 minutes left, but so the, I, I, I've, I've taught, I've taught three and one before. So towards the end, some of them are shorter. Like the one we did today, eight, that was kind of a shorter one, about the Vyasa Puja or Guru Puja. So, seems like the next one, there's a lot of writing. So does anybody have any uh, comments or questions before? And then when when would the um, the assessment, the test, be available? Then, like, when do we do that? Um. Well, because the tough thing is. Because sometimes people want to take the test immediately right after they've taken the course, because then it's all fresh in their mind, which makes sense. But of course, a lot of these things should be fresh in our mind, you know, <laughs> continually. Um, but yeah, I think we should take it definitely, uh, definitely um, sooner the better, you know. After, after we're completed on Sunday, August 14th, I think it is. So I think what you'll, you could do there in Las Vegas is that usually what we do is they call it a, you have a, a what do you call it, a proc, proctor? Something like that, yeah. Proctor, something like that, proctor, yeah. So it's somebody who, who will give the test out to all of you and who will just, hang around, you know, while you're taking the test. And then the, they'll, and then that person will, um, will, will collect the test. Maybe That's we can get Nanda to do it. Maybe I'll yeah. hang up. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking maybe David Nanda could do that. But usually you all probably just, you probably just go to the temple on Sundays, right? So, yeah. We also have a, we do a Bhagavad Gita study also on Wednesdays. So, because he has all those kids, we'll have to work around his schedule <laughs> or see what works for him. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I mean, we could have the, we, what, what time is the Sunday feast over there in Las Vegas? Yeah, we usually start eating about 7.30. And it starts at, at the latest, depending on how long. Six o'clock. Starts at six o'clock. Starts at six? Oh, that's good. Well, maybe what we could do is, if Dave and Nanda could meet all of you there, I think it should take an hour. Um, of course, it could take longer, but 
think it should take an hour, but if he meets you there at five at the temple, but that means we just have to have the class a little earlier. Like if we had the class from what, two to four, and then you have some time to look at the book and all that. I guess you have some time, maybe not a lot of time, but you have some time to look at the book and then you could go to the temple and take the test at five before the Sunday feast. What do you all think about that? My brain kind of went the following weekend, just so I would have a little bit of time to like- Yeah, sure. Move over sure. for maybe like the 21st, but- Yeah, sure. Flexible. What do you think about that, Tom and Sonia? Next, the following week? Yeah, because then you could look at the book and kind of think about everything we went through. Okay. All right. Yeah, sure. Then we could just have it at the same time, three to five on the 14th. And then the following week, uh, hopefully Dave and Nanda Prabhu can meet you there at the temple and you could take the test. So. All right. Sounds good. The two Justins were absent today. One of them said, told me, but the other one didn't. So I'll, I'll, I'll contact him and see. So, Prabhu, I know you're recording these classes. If we wanted to go back, like, you know, to the one day, you know, week one, week two, and look at them and kind of refresh through that too, where can we find the recorded, like, previous classes? Yeah. Um, what I could do is I could send all of the, I could send all of the recorded previous classes um, to you through by email. I'll send you the link. So I usually do that actually after every class, I, I'll send the recorded class, but, but yeah, I, I'll send them all to you, to all of you. All right. Okay, so we'll see you. Next time, then. Bye, Krishna. Thank you. Bye, Krishna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.